start with breaking news now at 7 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock from Milwaukee and the Pfizer Forum in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, usually home of the Milwaukee Bucks and for this week, the home of the Republican National Convention. Just two days after an assassination attempt on former President Trump. What was supposed to be a run-of-the-mill convention is now anything but. Trump and his newly minted running mate, newly just in the past couple of hours, J.D. Vance, the junior senator of Ohio, now have a very unique opportunity in front of them, with opportunities come danger. With that, we welcome you to the Ferris Show on television, live from the RNC on this Monday, day one. There is still three days to go. And Republicans here now face a real choice. Will they unite America like Donald Trump promised on True Social? Or will they, in Trump's words that I just heard from Kurt Bardella, chant fight, fight, fight? What is the new marching orders of the MAGA king, which Donald Trump is undoubtedly now, and he has picked his prince in J.D. Vance? 2024 feels sort of like this mix of 1968 with the anger and the division in America and the attempted assassination of Trump. 1980, because of an incumbent president that's unpopular, 84, because that's what Republicans want, a landslide. And lots of Republicans here keep talking about Reagan post-assassination attempt, that landslide in 1984. And that is possible. Republicans we talked to on the floor tell us that Saturday's assassination attempt on Trump's life only unifies the party, and it does. Nikki Haley is now speaking. Typically, turning to the center is a common theme at conventions. But Trump's pick of J.D. Vance, who we saw on the floor a little while ago for vice president, doubles down on the MAGA base rather than reach into the United States Center to help unite America. Vance is the pick of a man confident in victory that allows Donald Trump now to remake the Republican Party fully into the party of America first for decades to come. And Vance, though, he creates some problems on his own. He's young and he's untested at 39 years old. Folks not in this room necessarily, but across the country will ask if they want him one heartbeat away from the presidency. If now this new focus, and you see him and his young wife as they walk through today, if this focus now on the vice presidency doesn't change things. We start tonight with Bill O'Reilly, host of the No Spin News on BillOReilly.com, author of the coming book confronting the president's No Spin Assessments from Washington to Biden, who is currently listening to the roaring music behind me and thinking how happy he is that he doesn't have to cover conventions anymore. Bill, it is uh, good to see you, or at least cover them um, in person. I'll ask you the question that keeps getting asked to me um, by the more typical Republicans here in the hall. What voter, describe for me the voter who woke up this morning, Monday morning, was not going to vote for Donald Trump, and then saw J.D. Vance come out today, Trump picks J.D. Vance and say, oh, now I am going to vote for Donald Trump. Who is that voter? Well, it would be the working class Midwestern voter. That's the demographic that Vance appeals to. And in Michigan and Wisconsin, uh, in particular, Western Pennsylvania, uh, there's a lot of those voters. But I think that Marco Rubio would have helped him more as far as assembling votes. Nikki Haley certainly would have helped him more. But you're right in the sense that this is an in-your-face selection. It's MAGA all the way, um, and we're not going to make any compromises. We're not going to do any kind of outreach to the independent voter. Uh, we think we can win with what we have. And uh, J.D. Vance is basically Trump's shadow, with the exception of Ukraine, which is a big exception. Because Vance does not support U.S. aiding Ukraine to any great extent. We don't know what Trump feels about Ukraine. He's dodged the issue. But certainly J.D. Vance is not Zelensky's friend. Good, good point. This was Joe Biden on J.D. Vance. He was asked about it just a couple of minutes ago. Take a listen. It's not unusual. He's going to surround himself with people who agree completely with him. I have a voting record. I support him. Even though if you go back and listen to the things that J.D. Vance said about Trump. <laughs> 
He's a clone of Trump on the issues. A clone of Trump on the issues. So I don't see any difference. I guess in that sense, Joe Biden and the people behind me probably agree. I mean, this this is the image of Trump just just younger. Doesn't it present a Sarah Palin problem, though? There's middle of the road voters who just like like John McCain couldn't think of Sarah Palin as president. Isn't there a lot of folks who are thinking there, sitting there, not Trump supporters, but go, I don't like Joe Biden. I guess I'll vote for Donald Trump. And now I've got to think about, oh, my God, what if J.D. Vance, 39 years old, an isolationist, he's changed his views all the time. Doesn't this violate the first rule? Do no harm. Um, Number one, Kamala Harris is a shadow of Joe Biden, so I don't know really what Biden's complaining about. He's got the exact same situation with his vice president. Number two, uh, nobody votes for vice president. Um, just doesn't happen. Uh, J.D. Vance will pretty much be a good soldier, but he will give Kamala Harris a very hard time at the debate. He's uh, much quicker than Harris. Uh, he'll zoom in and, and expose her. She's not going to be able to stand up to him on any issue other than abortion. She'll crucify him on abortion. And January 6th, that's the vulnerability that Vance has made it clear that he believes the election was rigged in 2020. And the Democrats are going to go to town on that. Now, whether that will override the abysmal performance on the economy and the border for the Biden administration, I don't know. But certainly, uh, J.D. Vance presents some problems to the Republicans. Yeah, and I think some of his comments on abortion, certainly, um, I think he said that uh, children conceived in rape and incest were something like inconvenient um, situations or something along those lines. Uh, So this was him walking out. He'll have to define um, earlier. We don't want to put words in. Yeah. Yeah. Lila, we don't want to put words in his mouth. He'll have he'll have plenty of time to define that. Because every interviewer, except for the uh, sycophantic ones, will ask him about that. He's a converted, he converted to Catholicism, very conservative guy, but he's going to have to stand up and say, this is my vision. Trump did that. Trump just said, look, I support the Supreme Court. I want the local people to decide in their individual states. That's probably what Vance is going to do. I don't think Vance is going to go off quote, off the reservation very much in this campaign. All right. So, Bill, we're coming off of this sort of remarkable moment in American history. And you're, you're the guy who's wrote, wrote the killing books. There probably will be a killing Trump, an attempt to kill um, Donald Trump, which there was on Saturday, missed by a quarter of an inch. But This is a new Donald Trump. He's been disciplined over the past couple of weeks. Joe Biden imploded a couple of weeks ago. This is the moment for Donald Trump on Thursday night to show leadership in America and to change the conversation of this race. Joe Biden did not do that last night. He told everybody else in America what to do. He didn't say anything about what he would do. Trump says he ripped up his speech and is going to give a new one after getting shot. What should be in it? Well, number one, uh, Donald Trump should admit that he has made rhetorical mistakes and said, I'm going to try to do better. Because both Biden and Trump have attacked each other and other people in very personal ways. We all know that. Every voter in the country knows that. Also, both Biden and Trump, and I wrote a book called The United States of Trump, never admit mistakes. Never. If Donald Trump comes out in a conciliatory way and says, you know, looking back, I, I, I said some things I should not have said, and I'm going to try going forward to present my case in a very robust way, but to stay away from the personal stuff. That's all you have to say, and that, that took about 22 seconds. And he'd win. Because Biden's never going to admit a mistake. Wow. Ever in a million years will Biden admit, admit a mistake. Never has in his entire and career. And Trump will? Changes Trump's his never position all over the place. Never admitted a mistake. But he could. And if he does, he'll win the election, in my opinion. Could, could we argue that either man, if either person was willing to admit a mistake and be the first one to show real leadership, 
on this issue of bringing America together and say, look, I'm going to change the way I talk about things. Would that not change this race for either man? Well, it would change it for Trump. I don't know if it would be changing for Biden or not. But certainly if Trump showed a little humility and said, you know, I've go overdone it. And now I'm going to try not to. But this uh, bringing together the country, that's just a myth. It's a foolish statement made by journalists who are too dumb to understand the state of the country. When you have a progressive movement that controls a president of the United States like they have with uh, Joe Biden, and you're moving so far left that it's almost dizzying, and you have a traditional force in America on the other side, they're not coming together, Leland. They're not. Yeah. This political gulf is as big as it's ever been since the Civil War. It's not coming together. What has to happen is that the hate brigade. Bill, I'm going to introduce you. I'm going to interrupt you real second, real quick for the national anthem here. We'll listen in. Challenge Choir with the National Anthem to start off night one of the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee, back with Bill O'Reilly, who I think you made an excellent point. This is not a political divide in America. It's a cultural divide, traditional values versus progressive values. And the, the traditional values will play out throughout the four nights here. But if politics is downstream of culture... What you're saying is we can't turn down the temperature on politics in America because the culture war is too hot. And I ask you, as somebody who was the original culture warrior, how then does the war end? There is a way to tamp it down, and that is to come down hard on the corporations that fund hatred. So MSNBC is the most hateful network in the history of the American Republic, by far. Comcast NBC News owns that network. They pay people millions of dollars to hate. That company should be held accountable. And today it it pulled off their signature morning show, Morning Joe, it pulled it off the air because it's that hateful. The View on ABC News Disney is the most hateful daytime program of all time. Even today, they couldn't stop with the white men and the Republicans and all of this. They could not control themselves. Disney writes their checks. I said on my broadcast in Osman News, I gave out the information. 
how Americans can write letters, email, call the CEOs of these corporations and say, you better knock it off. We're not going to consume your product or anybody that advertises on your network ever again. That's the way to attack Boy, the hate okay, brigade. But, no, but... Okay, attacking, though, just continues the war. And dare I say, no, you and I both work for a network down. that I won't name on the... It's, you're, you're talking about Fox, and Fox has tamped it down considerably. And they did that while I was there. I saw it happen. Okay? They get rid of fanatical people now. The most extreme guy on is Gutfeld, and he's a satirist. He's like Colbert. That's what they do. But their mainstream pundits may be partisan, but they're not using very often personal attacks. They're not calling people Nazis and racists. They don't do that at FMC. So we got to stop that. We, the American people, you watch what you want to watch. But if you are contributing to the hate brigade, then you should be ashamed of yourself. All right, fair enough. And you, you made the point about MSNBC. We're going to get that later in the show with um, Colby Hall as the party here in Milwaukee continues. Bill, thank you. We'll see you throughout the week. I know you're a little later in the night um, as well. If elected, J.D. Vance would be the second youngest vice president in U.S. history, replacing Richard Nixon on that list. So what exactly does youth on the ticket bring? Who does J.D. Vance bring as a voter? And we heard calls for a less partisan convention after Saturday's assassination attempt. Will the speakers tonight, I have new reporting on what the speakers tonight will and will not say because of those calls. Welcome back. Live pictures of the Republican National Convention here in Milwaukee. Waiting to hear from Senator Ron Johnson, Congressman Marjorie Taylor Greene this hour. The convention was supposed to be pretty boring. Now it is anything but. The assassination attempt on Donald Trump Saturday changed everything. Donald Trump's new running mate, J.D. Vance, initially has suggested that Democrats are to blame, directly to blame. He wrote on Twitter, the central premise of the Biden campaign is that President Donald Trump is an authoritarian fascist who must be stopped at all costs. That rhetoric led directly to President Trump's attempted assassination. To be fair, we don't know anything really about the motivation of the shooter. But Vance certainly captured the sentiment of a lot of the people behind us. Senator Joni Ernst of Iowa is with us, ma'am. It is nice to see you. Thanks so much. much. We're about to hear the first speeches, and uh, fair to say Ron Johnson, I think Marjorie Taylor Greene, especially in the House, are are not the most demure of the Republican crew. Uh, We have heard that the Trump campaign is telling speakers to cool and to take this opportunity to show that Republicans can be leaders on uniting America. Will the speakers listen? I think they will. Obviously, with Donald J. Trump as our candidate, our nominee for president, our former president, he is leading this party. And so his direction, I think, will be heeded by our speakers. We know that the time is for a softer tenor, one of unity, the one that differentiates the policies of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. We are the party of middle America, hardworking Americans. Their party is the party of coastal elites. There is a huge difference, and I hope that's what we hear from our speakers. Draw draw out um, that difference. You said unity. And the the term on President Trump's uh, true social right after Joe Biden's last speech was unite America. What exactly does that look like in me? It means we need to tone down the rhetoric, but really have thoughtful conversations about the differences in policies. But what we need to do is bring more Americans into the fold, be actively engaged with their government. We need transparency in government. So let's unite around policies that make America great 
yet once again as Donald okay, Trump Okay, so I, I get that, but that that sounds an awful lot like just telling Democrats to all get on the, the elephant yeah. train and, and wander through the cornfields of Iowa. Well, they won't. Right. They won't. But what can we talk about? We can talk about child care. We can talk about energy policy that's sustainable and yet available and affordable for all Americans. It doesn't mean we all have to drive an electric vehicle. So there are a lot of things that will resonate with common sense Democrats that feel their party has left them behind. And look, to be fair, we've talked to a lot of Democrats who feel their party um, has indeed left them. But that the things you just talked about do require compromise for Republicans. Talking about immigration and actually dealing with it rather than talk about it requires compromise. Uh, forgive me, but I, I have a hard time imagining we're going to hear speeches from Republicans talking about the need to compromise with Democrats. Likely not. Um, <laughs> not maybe not tonight on this okay. floor. But I can tell you that Republicans are common sense. When it comes to energy, we do believe in all of the above. What we don't believe is mandating to the American people, this is the type of vehicle that you will drive within five years. Um, so we are all about talking about what are smart solutions for America, what works for hardworking Americans' pocketbooks, how can we make their lives better. Um, and that, that does resonate with those that might identify as Democrats but feel that their party has left them in the Let's talk about policies, especially of, of J.D. Vance. Ron Johnson's on the stage right now. Senator, you know well, J.D. Vance, you're also a veteran. I am. When it comes to American foreign policy, J.D. Vance is an iso the isolationist among isolationists in terms of what he views about Ukraine, how he looks at American foreign policy. That is not the party of Reagan. How is America safer when we isolate ourselves in a way that the last couple of times we've done have led to the deaths of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Americans? Well, I would say that this is going to be a debate coming out in the future, and I am a veteran. I served for over 23 years between the Army Reserves, the Iowa National Guard, served in Iraq and, and Kuwait. So J.D. Vance is also a veteran. He believes in serving America. What he doesn't believe in is endless wars, which is very reflective of where Donald Trump is. It doesn't mean that we don't engage globally. It just means that we should focus more on the policies that deter our adversaries. So he is all about focusing on China, pressing back against China so that we don't well, have to. I, 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 I get that. I get that. I'm, I, I'm old enough to remember the 2012 campaign when Mitt Romney said Russia was the greatest, yeah, the greatest enemy we faced. And he got laughed at. He turned out to be right. Uh, Confronting Vladimir Putin and the world, I think you've said it yourself on this program and others that I've anchored, mm -hmm. the world is safer when America is leading. That's not the foreign policy that J.D. Vance advocates. Well, it is the policy that Joni Ernst advocates. I know, which, which so, I'm, I'm trying to point out there is a divide no, here, and there, a divide in the Republican Party on this. Well, there this is... This is not the party of Reagan anymore. But there is a divide, but it is not a great divide. Because what we do believe in is rebuilding the strength of the American military. What we do believe in is securing our southern border. All of these things will make us safer by deterring our adversaries and allowing them easy access into the United States of America. Okay. So J.D. Vance is our vice presidential candidate. And I can tell you what, he is going to be a phenomenal leader. All right. Fair enough. Joni Ernst, thank so you very much, ma'am. We appreciate it. You bet. Donald Trump gained a significant victory today. You may not have heard about it. 1,500 miles south of here in Miami, Judge Eileen Cannon dismissed his classified documents case. The decision quickly tested the media's calls for civility and toning things down. There wasn't much unity in some of the coverage. Well, look, I think it's a terrible decision. I think it's absolutely wrong on the merits. But going forward, I think this could actually be a blessing in disguise because it gives Jack Smith an opportunity to appeal the case immediately. So many of these other decisions were within the judge's discretion as she was slow walking the case. But this is one where it's immediately appealable. And I think she is so clearly wrong on the law that the 11th Circuit will reverse. 
right, Tom Dupree with us now, former Deputy Assistant Attorney General under George W. Bush. Tom, I texted you this morning. You didn't seem very surprised. I wasn't surprised, Leland. You could kind of see this coming when the United States Supreme Court issued its immunity decision a few days ago. You'll recall there was a concurrence written by Justice Thomas where he basically laid out a roadmap for how you would find Jack Smith's appointment to be unconstitutional. Today's decision from Judge Cannon relies heavily on Justice Thomas's opinion. So I think it's no secret here. She read what Justice Thomas had to say. She paid careful attention to it. And she wrote a very long uh, 93-page opinion declaring the appointment to be unconstitutional and bringing this case, at least for now, to a close. All right, so that's what Justice Thomas had to say. Does that mean that all these folks can celebrate that the Trump document case is over? Well, I wouldn't say it's over for sure because her decision will go up on appeal. It'll go up to the federal appeals court that supervises the courts in Florida, and they'll take a look at it. And it's possible it can also go back up to the United States Supreme Court. But the one thing that's for sure here, Leland, is the chance of that classified documents case going to trial anytime soon before the election, maybe even in 2025. Basically, the chance of that is zero. A big fat zero. Um one thing, it's actually interesting, I was going to say, the one thing we haven't heard from or about is I've walked around and talked to Republicans. You don't hear Joe Biden's name virtually at all. They kind of uh, almost feel as though they, they've won this election, so they don't need to talk about it. But you really don't hear Hunter Biden's name, which is something unique now uh, in the Republican Party, at least, dot, dot, dot. Should Republicans who are celebrating this also realize that one special counsel getting thrown out means the other special counsel who prosecuted Hunter Biden gets thrown out. Yeah, well, look, it's true that what's sauce for the goose is going to be sauce for the gander. I think in Hunter Biden's case, there's one difference, which is that we'll recall the special counsel who's prosecuting Hunter Biden is actually a U.S. attorney, Senate-confirmed U.S. attorney, which is different than what Jack Smith is. And that was one of the points that Judge Cannon made in the opinion. She said that even though she's saying Jack Smith's appointment was unconstitutional, that doesn't mean that you can't have special counsels. They just have to be appointed the right way. Interesting. All right, Tom Dupree will follow this special counsel. This is something that um, seemed to keep growing over the years. We get more and more of them. Mr. Dupree, thank you. Appreciate it. For two weeks, past two and a half weeks, all we talked about was Joe Biden's disastrous debate performance. That's it. Now all we're showing is pictures of Republicans partying. New reporting on how Biden will use this week to reset. Welcome back to the Republican National Convention. We're taking a brief pause for a concert of type with the singing along as it goes. We haven't seen really one of a convention like this in eight years. So there's a lot of Republicans who are awfully happy here. They're happy to be here. They're celebrating, but they are angry about the assassination attempt on Donald Trump, and understandably so. Their logic goes like this. Democrats say Trump is Hitler. Hitler must be eliminated. What did you expect? You hear that over and over again out on the floor. President Biden facing tough questions about his rhetoric regarding Donald Trump today. Uh, on a call a week ago, you said it's time to put Trump in the bullseye. There's some dispute about the, the context, but I think you appreciate. The I didn't words say crosshairs. I was talking about focus on. Look, the truth of the matter was what I guess I was talking about at the time was there was very little focus on Trump's uh, agenda. Yeah, the term was bullseye. It was, a, it was a mistake to use the word. I didn't, I didn't say crosshairs. I meant bullseye. I meant focus on him. Focus on what he's doing. Focus on, on, his, on his policies. Hard to understand whether he was apologizing for not saying crosshairs or saying bullseye. Alex Thompson with us now, national political correspondent for Axios. Good to see you. Appreciate it. Okay. Heard from President Biden last night. He said a lot of things, none of which what, what he said, what he was going to do different. 2024 campaign for Joe Biden took about a 48-hour pause because of the Trump assassination attempt. He's back on the trail tomorrow in Vegas. Does his stump speech change? I'm sure there will be some small changes, but you saw the campaign respond to the announcement of J.D. Vance today. They said that basically J.D. was only picked because he would do what Mike Pence would not. They said that he would 
you know, take away fundamental rights. Both the president and the vice president said, protect democracy, stop Trump Vance. This, you know, the, the, the calling to cool the temperature lasted maybe 16 hours. I'm sure you probably won't repeat the bullseye statement again. But the thing is, like, this is only going to get hotter and hotter. At least, so that's like the indication from these first well, few hours. How much of that is out of necessity? Because the only thing that was uniting Democrats and giving Biden any chance of holding this coalition together was scaring people about Donald Trump. Well, this is the strategic, this was what the Biden team was saying they were going to do, is that once voters realized Trump was the general election candidate and they realized all the things he was going to do, then they would actually start leading in the polls. So how can you do that if you're saying, actually, we're going to go back to a positive pro-Biden message? And I don't know if there is a way they can. Okay, does this end... And, you know, crazy things have happened. We all didn't expect the debate performance. We all didn't expect the calls for Biden to leave. No one expected an assassination attempt on President Trump. Crazy things happen. Does this now end the replace Biden conversation? I think it's making it quieter, but it has not ended. I can tell you beneath the surface, the conversations are continuing in earnest. The problem is that they are pausing in terms of going public with it. After this RNC, I bet you you are going to have a very critical week next week in which all these voices are going to come out yet again, and there's going to be a real conversation. Now, Joe Biden's a stubborn person. He's a resilient person, and he's made it very clear. I have no intention of getting out of the race, and I have no intention of changing my mind. And there's, I, I am not clear what that mechanism would be, because he believes to his core that he is the most electable Democrat against Donald Trump. If you believe that, why would you step aside? Something interesting happened after the shooting and the assassination attempt on Donald Trump. We heard from John Josh Shapiro, one of the rising stars in the Democratic Party, governor of Pennsylvania, take a listen. Political disagreements can never, ever be addressed through violence. Disagreements are okay, but we need to use a peaceful political process to settle those differences. Where all leaders need to take down the temperature and rise above the hateful rhetoric that exists and search for a better, brighter future for this nation. How many Democrats are sitting around and saying, boy, if there was someone to articulate the Democratic message other than Joe Biden, a la Josh Shapiro, we might have a chance. I mean, there's a lot. The problem is that none of them are Jill Biden, Hunter Biden, Anthony Bernal, Annie Tomasini, Mike Donald, all the people surrounding Joe Biden that are going to make the decision. None of them are thinking that. Is that going to change after they see the exceptional win streak? Axios just wrote about this, that, J that Donald Trump is enjoying. The, I, I don't know. I mean, really, the only thing that's going to move this to the point where people that Biden really respects, people like Nancy Pelosi, people that are actually very close to him to change, you're going to have to see what the what the polling looks like after this convention and after the attempted assassination yep. and what donors do in the next two weeks. It's going to be a critical two or three weeks before Biden. And you will be leading the reporting on it as you do, my friend. Good right. to see you. An ice cream shop full of scoops over here. Trump campaign, his campaign, understands uh, how powerful the video, uh, not a Marjorie Taylor Greene speaking, but they do understand how powerful the video of the attempted assassination is, how they plan to honor the retired fire chief from this, from this stage that Trump's would-be assassin killed. Republican Congresswoman, at least in the first couple of speeches here at the RNC, the speakers have certainly heeded the words of the Trump campaign to cool it and tone it down. We didn't hear nearly as much of the firebrand rhetoric from her as you would expect. We'll see how that plays out over the week. Donald Trump survived a sniper's bullet on Saturday. A retired fire chief at his rally did not. Marjorie Taylor Greene just mentioned Corey Compepitore, and if I know anything about Trump and Republicans honoring him, will take center stage during prime time. Today, the Secretary of Homeland Security, who oversees the Secret Service, had very little in the way of answers. An incident like this cannot happen. We are speaking of a failure. We are going to analyze through an independent review uh, how that occurred, why it occurred, and make recommendations and findings to make sure it doesn't happen again. 
News Nation senior political correspondent Brian Enton in western Pennsylvania reporting, and I kind of like doing this, not on the shooter who we still don't know much more about or his motive, but on the victim here. And I come back to it, Brian, I've said to 100 people uh, about his friendship with his neighbor, an ardent Trump supporter, Corey was, and an ardent Biden supporter, his neighbor was. Yeah, I mean, look, we've spent the last uh, day and a half uh, getting to know Corey through his friends and through some extended family members. And uh, he, he was a hero. He was an amazing guy. Uh, he was uh, the former chief of the volunteer fire department. Everybody in this community pretty much knew him. Um, he loved his family. He loved his wife, his high school sweetheart. He loved his two daughters. He was a proud girl dad. And he loved... Uh, former President Trump. He was excited to go to the rally with his family, but you mentioned it. I mean, he had neighbors who were also Biden supporters, and he loved them, too. Um, you know, they would get out, they would talk, they would debate, um, but then at the end of the day, they were neighbors and they were friends, and they would barbecue together, and they would share lawn equipment, and we heard those stories over and over again, which uh, for this community is why it's such a tragedy, uh, because, you know, they, they just, they're heartbroken here, Leland. They continue to be heartbroken. Uh, the fairgrounds yeah. behind me, where the rally happened, is still shut down. It's still a crime scene. The FBI's been out there all day long. Uh, and while this has now become a national conversation in terms of the attempted assassination here in Butler, Pennsylvania, uh, this is this is a, a, a town that's, um, you know, that that's just very, very sad. So I think about that. I'm pulling up right now the 2020 uh, election results, 2016. That part of Western Pennsylvania is what flipped. Uh, red in 2016 gave Donald Trump the election. It flipped back. Blue gave Joe Biden the election. So it's the swing of swing counties. And I'm wondering, as the nation talks about this cooling of the temperature, is the temperature all that hot politically in Butler, Pennsylvania, or have they figured out how to get along in a way our politicians can't seem to? I mean, it's a very um, patriotic place. There's no question about that. It's the kind of place you drive around and every other house, it feels like, has a, uh, an American flag. Many of those American flags are half staff sadly, today uh, because of what happened and in honor of Corey. But everyone we've talked to today says they get along with their neighbors here. I mean, there were even, it was interesting, there were several women I interviewed earlier who were at the Trump rally who weren't even really Trump supporters. They said they just wanted to get out and experience the rally and see uh, a former president face to face. They just thought it would be cool to see a former president. Where else do you go and hear that? Where people are so divided, they would never go to a Trump rally. They would never want to see right. former President Trump just because they don't support him. Here we met people who just wanted to be at the rally. It was really just like an event in town that, that everybody wanted to go to, whether they supported him or not, from what we can tell. Yeah, one can imagine uh, Butler, Pennsylvania might be getting another Trump rally, uh, perhaps right before the election. I'm thinking uh, the, the closing event of the Trump campaign very likely could be uh, at the fairgrounds behind you. Brian Enton, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Uh, live pictures back here at the RNC. It feels like a Trump rally here. The playlist is very much the same uh, in the warm-up acts to um, Donald Trump. We're taking a look at the stage. Um, right now. Interestingly enough, uh, on a big political morning, MSNBC, Morning Joe, would have been talking about what you're seeing right here. There would have been a lot of previewing the Republican National Convention, but MSNBC pulled President Biden's favorite show. What that means for news coverage in America tomorrow, next. <laughs> Welcome back to the Republican National Convention. They're ahead of schedule. A couple of the people talking later, Tim Scott and Glenn Youngkin, who were both on the VP shortlist and obviously did not make it. The first two main speakers we've heard, in fact, three, did not have any of the fire, the brimstone, the wire brushing of Joe Biden that we would have expected before Saturday. So the memo, at least for Republicans to change their rhetoric, so far has been heated. If that's going to continue going forward, the media is going to be the one that has to enforce the rules. 
fairly in terms of toning down the temperature. They, after all, are the referees. Colby Hall, contributor and founding editor of Mediaite, is with us. Uh, you mentioned and noted that MSNBC's Morning Joe, which is their uh, morning program, it's the favorite, president, uh, favorite television show of uh, President Biden, was off the air this morning. Does that mean that there is starting to be a fairness, or is this just a one-off way of trying to say by the media we're doing our part before they go back to being partisan. I don't think it's the end of opinion media or progressive points of view on MSNBC. It was a stunning decision, and, and I think likely a miscalculation by MSNBC and NBC News Brass. This is their flagship show, and they basically, it's a tacit admission that they didn't trust them with either covering breaking news from the assassination attempt on Trump or saying something so stupid that they would draw criticism. So what did they do? They pulled the plug. And yeah, like I, it's a stunning decision that I think got a lot of feedback and the repercussions were still sort of feeling. Feeling still in the media world, I'm going to give you the last 30 seconds. Uh, since January 6th, the media has held Republicans to account it's not just enough to condemn violence. You cannot use rhetoric that might inspire violence. Thank you. Now, we hear Joe Biden's going to keep saying Donald Trump is a threat to democracy and say the very same things as before the shooting. What happens in terms of the coverage of Joe Biden? Violent rhetoric is in the eye of the beholder, right? And, you know, a left-leaning media loves to condemn that which they believe is sort of dangerous rhetoric. But they, they clearly very often employ the same thing, right? So, you know, this idea that he's a threat to democracy, he's you know, the next Hitler, of course that's irresponsible hyperbole. Um, we see it on both sides. And, you know, I, I'm not expecting the media to suddenly take on a new tone of unity. Neither am I expecting that from Trump or Biden either. Yeah, well, that's probably fair um, in terms of Alex Thompson said it would last about 16 hours. Um, and that's that's where we're at because it gets it gets viewers. Colby, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Obviously, uh, the media coverage of this week will be a big part of it, something Republicans like to complain an awful lot about. Interestingly enough, uh, Colby, thank you. The grievances uh, here so far, at least at the RNC, have not been center stage, which is a new Republican Party. Chris picks it up from New York. I'll see you in a couple hours. Africa.